Hi there, hope you're having a lovely day so far. Well, pregnancy is such a wonderful experience in any woman's life, if not the greatest. And what an experience it will be for all expecting parents to one day tell their daughter or their son that they were born during a pandemic. Well, for all mums-to-be, their birthing experience right now is very different in the COVID-19 world. And the COVID-19 era has brought some new concerns uh, to the pending ar arrival of a newborn that no doubt brings a lot of anxiety. You know, what is normally an exciting experience has, has become a little bit more of a high stress situation as standard practices have had to adapt for safety and for protection. You know, at no other time in a woman's life does she experience such a flood of hormonal fluctuations as during pregnancy and in the postpartum period. And I think at this time, we really should be quite empathetic and mindful for all pregnant women who have an added layer of concern at this time on top of their already heightened emotions. So to ensure that we're helping parents to feel supported in their maternal anxiety, we welcome our special guest, Kathy Frey. Now, Kathy is a midwife extraordinaire. She's a best-selling author and award-winning international private maternity consultant. Now, as a holistically-minded midwife, Kathy is a passionate prom promoter of mums-to-be accessing empowering maternity education and uh, as a thought leader and integrated maternity healthcare inf uh, information she actually does pass that on to everybody that she's affiliated with and we're really 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 grateful for her time so thank you so much for joining us Kathy how are you I'm good thank you for inviting me most welcome <laughs> Well, um, the birth experience for parents um, during this time is very different from any other in recent history. Um, firstly, mm. if a woman is pregnant, um, in your opinion, how do you think she is best to, to look after herself um, in isolation, provided the changes to the typical face-to-face -face contacts that, that would have been otherwise? Yeah, I, I think that it is very much that women need to appreciate that the fact that they are pregnant makes them immunocompromised. Um, we become, it's part of how a woman's body does not reject the baby and um, is, a, is a foreign body that she wants to fight. So naturally, <sighs> physiologically, we become immunocompromised. And uh, so you do need to think of yourself just like those 70-year-olds. That's, that's where you, you're at. Um, so, you know, have that level of isolation. Just assume that everybody out there could give you the bug. And um, I think that within recent, you know, it's funny because like when in the days of when my mother was pregnant, which is going back a bit, um, you know, you, a woman did not go to work past showing. You know, it was just frowned upon. Um, it's not healthy and not what she should be doing. And, and it would look poorly upon your husband as well that he couldn't provide for you. Um, but we certainly have swung the pendulum way too far the other way, in my opinion, as a midwife, where we've got women assuming that working full time at 37 weeks and going to the gym and everything is absolutely fine and it's not fine. Um, so in a way, all of this forced isolation and working from home, you know, us midwives are kind of going, yay, <laughs> you know, we're probably going to have less women getting gestational diabetes, less, um, uh, uh, uterine growth restriction on, on babies growing poorly, less women getting preeclampsic toxemia, maybe because all these women are actually having to chill out and they're not in the morning traffic and all of that busyness. Um, but I guess the general rule is just think of yourself as a 70-year-old as far as your immune system is concerned, mm -hmm. that you are compromised. Mm. And what should normal antenatal care look like during this um, abnormal period um, during the, the pandemic? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, there's certainly been a lot of work going on behind the scenes, um, you know, for some new guidelines to sort of say, well, what, what's our new normal? Um, mm. Because obviously um, there's physical assessments that need to occur as part of healthy, good antenatal um, care. And, um, but at the same time, there's a lot of chatty conversation that goes on, which is also very important, but 
that does that have to be done in person? So that's really where okay. that differential is occurring now, is that it is sort of strongly suggested that a lot of that antenatal conversation, or basically nearly all of it, takes place, you know, online as Zoom meetings and that sort of thing between mm. the midwife and the mother, or the obstetrician and the mother to be. And um, but there are certainly some times where some face to face are needed. So I thought this would be a a good idea if that we do go over what would be a reasonable amount of face-to-face -face, you know so the women don't feel like they're not getting enough attention or they're getting too much attention right because yep. um, so so generally speaking um, during that first 12 weeks and you know that first trimester um, there would need there should ideally be one face-to-face -face, a quick Face to face with most of the con because there's a lot of conversation that has to occur on a first booking um, appointment where the midwife or obstetrician is getting the full um, medical history on that woman, etc. So that so all of that should really ideally be done over the phone. But there needs to be one probably in person where a very short face to face where they can um, particularly get a baseline of that woman's blood pressure, um, do a urine dipstick analysis. Um, and uh, her height, her weight, um, and get her initial blood. So those, all those baseline pieces of information that are needed. Um, but ideally, it could be something as quick as five minutes in person um, and, you know, 45 minutes on the phone or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So then when we get into that second trimester, um, I'm just looking at my notes here. So <laughs> there should be probably um, a... Well, usually you would have an ultrasound scan, an anatomy scan, somewhere between that sort of 18 to 20 weeks. Um, and so ba that's really sort of the only thing that needs to happen at the beginning. You could probably do another sort of video, face-to-face, phone-type checkup at around sort of 12 to 16 weeks. Then another one around sort of 16 to 20 weeks. It's kind of like once a month sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, at somewhere around 20 to 24 weeks, um, I think it would be time to do another face-to-face. -face. So that would be the second face-to-face -face appointment. Mm -hmm. um, and again, blood pressure check particularly being done, um, listening into the fetal heartbeat, urine analysis, etc. cetera. Um, so then sort of say a few weeks after that, somewhere between 24, 26 weeks to another phone call. Um, and then approximately 28 weeks, so at the beginning of the third trimester, you'd have, say, your third face-to-face -face, um, at around 28 weeks and do that, um, again, blood pressure, fetal heartbeat check. And that's particularly when the midwife will be starting to feel the size of the womb. And, you know, midwives and obstetricians, that's one of those things we really get pretty good at is knowing what the, the womb should be measuring at for it particular gestations mm -hmm. um, so then sort of another few weeks later 30 32 weeks another phone call maybe mm -hmm. um, 32 34 weeks a fourth face-to-face -face. that's also uh, again to have another little feel of that belly and make sure that the growth is going well um, and that's where we start to get particularly vigilant for things to do with like preeclampsia um, or any fetal growth concerns um, so another set of bloods would get done at that time and um, then probably another maybe a phone call after that and really from about 37 <coughs> weeks onwards the woman should have a weekly in-person assessment to particularly check her blood pressure and her urine analysis but again they can be very quick um, and the, the rest of it can be done on the phone um, although those are the guidelines around healthy, normal woman with healthy, normal babies on board. So obviously, if that woman has any pre-existing pre medical conditions that need to be taken on, into account or her pregnancy has developed any conditions, then that changes the picture and she may need to be seen more often. So if we sort of sum it up and say once before 12 weeks, once after the 20-week anatomy <coughs> scan, once at the beginning of the third trimester at about... 28 weeks, once again, sort of four weeks later at about 34 weeks, and then from 37 weeks onwards weekly. Mm, wonderful advice. Thank yeah. you, Kathy, for that. And oh. 
<laughs> How are you seeing birth plans change and adapt to the COVID-19 restrictions at the moment? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so those women who were already planning a home birth or a birth centre birth, their, thing, their plans haven't really particularly changed um, mm-hmm. so much. It's certainly the women who were planning to um, be delivered at hospital, that's where the change is. Because most of the, like, if you are a woman who has some risk factors to your pregnancy, so you're not really re- um home birth or um, birth centre births are not recommended for you because of your complications in your pregnancy um, or with your baby. So, well, you know, the option's kind of taken away from you in a way. Uh, and it, But the biggest challenge is for those women who do not need to be at a hospital. They have a healthy, normal pregnancy with a healthy, normal baby and no risk factors for anything. But for in their mindset, they assume that the hospital would be the safest place to be, which statistically it's not, interestingly enough, for healthy, normal women having spontaneous natural labour. But um, there is a perception that it's the safest place to be. And But now we know it's full of a a bug so it's kind of that's a really tricky place for them because you know they were thinking of going to the hospital for it because it was going to be safer but now they know it's not necessarily safer um and the idea you know usually i'm being very stereotypical here (laughs) but usually women who have healthy, normal pregnancies, but want to be in a secondary care facility like a hospital to give birth, um, we're probably not planning to have a natural uh, labour and give birth normally. They were probably assuming that um, they would have an epidural, that it would all be pain-free, that was their goal, um, and accepted the fact that that could lead to the consequence of their baby being delivered rather than them giving birth. So um, meaning that the baby could uh, have a much higher chance of needing an instrumental delivery, so that's forceps or Vontus, or an emergency cesarean delivery, because that's just what, that is a side effect of epidurals. So um, although Hmm. maybe some women don't realise that. Um, So so it's a really big deal for them to completely change their mindset it's, it's almost like the hippie in them has to come out which they might have never been in touch with before or they might have suppressed after they turned 16 but so you know but we all have that inner goddess in us and um it's about getting in touch with her so so just to cl- uh, clarify so you've mentioned um that hospitals aren't necessarily the safest place for a, w- a woman to be giving birth um and yeah. that the the um the the thought of um considering either um a, a home birth or a birthing center is possibly a, a, a better option um for mothers is that purely just because of the exposure to COVID-19 in hospitals is there anything else that is no the, yeah good question um well we, well there was some you know how can we, when hospital birth became popular which <laughs> was um you know, less than 100 years ago, you know, we we were in a time when we didn't have um, ultrasounds. So home birthing did have dangers to it because there could be conditions going on that nobody knew about because it couldn't we couldn't see them in advance. We couldn't predict them. So things like placenta previa, where the placenta is growing out over the, the, the exit hole, um, undiagnosed twins, undiagnosed... Um, anatomical abnormality on the baby, undiagnosed large for dates, undiagnosed growth restricted baby, all these things. So going to hospital was safer, it did become safer than uh, home birthing when we didn't have access to ultrasounds. But now that we have got access to ultrasounds, so there's a lot of things that we can tick off the list and just know are not a danger to that woman mm-hmm. laboring at home. Um, so that's where I sort of come back to when you've got a healthy, normal woman having a healthy, normal pregnancy, um, then forget it, irrelevant to COVID situations. Um, it's statistically the safest place for her to give birth is a birth centre. Mm-hmm. 
Mm, and then close second to that is a mm. home birth, which is interesting. Um, there was some extensive research that was done um, a few years ago where uh, over 4,000 births um, were looked at retrospectively. And these are all healthy, normal women um, who some went to birth centers and some went to hospital. Mm. And they, but they're all low risk women, basically. And uh, of those women, the mothers, I'm just reading the stats here, but if they went to the hospital, if they chose to go to the hospital, they, um, or sorry, the other way around, if they chose to go to the, the primary care facility, the birth center, instead of the hospital care facility, um, mothers were four times less likely to have an emergency C-section, mothers were one and a half times less likely to hemorrhage, the mothers were five times less likely to be admitted to a high dependency unit or an operating theatre or intensive care, the babies were three times less likely to have low APGAR scores, the babies were half as likely to need admission to neonatal units. And the, whole, the main reason that all of that um, was came about was simply, simply really, because these healthy normal women having healthy normal pregnancies and healthy normal labours um, did not opt for, were not able to opt for an epidural. So what the consequence of that is, because when you put an epidural on, you take a labour from low risk to high risk. Mm. Um, but if you don't put the epidural on that normal woman, then wow, amazing, she just gives birth normally. Whereas if you put the epidural on that normal woman and you take her from low risk to high risk, the outcome is that we have more fetal distress, we have more failure to progress in first stage and not dilatate properly, we have more um, obstructed labours where the baby went to send properly, and there's all these other things that happen that end up as instrumental emergency del deliveries and surgical emergency deliveries. So, um, but it's very difficult when you're in a hospital setting sometimes to kind of have access to the same things that you can have access to at a birth center to enable you to manage the pain of that labor without needing an epidural. Mm -hmm. And often those women, um, if they are thinking automatically, oh, I'm going to go straight for the epidural, well, they haven't necessarily investigated a lot of their other options. Um, you know, so have they hired themselves a TENS machine? Have they um, did they get their aromatherapy? Did they get their homeopathic drops? Did they do it? Well, no, they probably haven't. So um, if you don't, whereas the birth center minded women have probably usually done all that stuff and that gets them through, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I'd love so to know. I'm not anti-epidural, but I am anti-woman not understanding the consequence of that decision. Because often women do later say, oh, I so wish I didn't have the epidural because from that moment onwards, my labor went to custard and it ended up as an emergency, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. Mm. And I understand the ability to have a doula has altered during this time as well. And doulas cannot be in the delivery room if a woman's partner is there because of the visitation policies limiting to one person, um, which makes it very difficult for the doulas to do um, and fulfill part of their job. I'd, I'd love to know what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, that is really um, a shame. Um <sighs> Uh, different countries have different prevalence of doulas, which is an interesting thing. So the more medicalized the country, the more popular doulas can be in a way. And the le um, countries that are less medicalized um, with their mm. obstetric care have less doulas. So um, because doulas have sort of almost been a way to kind of protect the woman from the cascade of intervention. Um, but I do honestly, but I, you know, personally, I have, you know, I've had hundreds and hundreds of, of, of births that I've attended over the years, and I've only had doulas at a few because I happen to have a clientele that are already in that mindset that they're doing things naturally and normally, and we get their partner educated up on it enough that they're confident to do those roles. Mm. Um, you know, so I, I feel for the doulas because, I mean, you've, we've basically just strangled them out of their jobs at the moment, and what they do is really important. But 
I, but there absolutely is the way to be able to have a partner, have enough education with a holistically minded midwife in there guiding them a bit that they can still have beautiful, empowering, lovely births yes. without having a doula there. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> and in fact, sometimes I have seen doulas take over, which is actually almost a downside because um, it depends on the doula's personality, but sometimes you get it where it should be the partner giving her that massage and her sacrum, you know, like he should be in there being part doing that, but actually he's sitting back on his phone answering a text because the doula's doing it. Yes. Yeah. So it's kind of cool to get the guys. I mean, I mean, not all partners are guys, but it's, it's quite cool to get, especially the guys tend to be more nervous about this stuff and, and they, it can actually do amazingly well. We yes. Teach them a and little bit beforehand. In the end, um, the last few months, pregnant women have had to avoid interactions with their family and friends. Um, and this, no doubt, uh, emotionally has been really tough on them as um, they've had to, you know, self isolate themselves away from loved ones um, in, in order to stay safe. And I guess, in, in what's already an emotionally heightened time, um, what's your advice for mums? Um, to be, to still share the experience with loved ones? Um, I think that uh, while you're pregnant, you know, it's probably pretty easy to do, to be honest, you know, and just get on the old Facebook or Zooms or whatever. And and I'm at the other end of the spectrum where our, we've got three grown-up kids and none of them are under our roof and we're in lockdown. I'm like, oh my God, I always you were 10 years younger and you had to be under my roof. <laughs> so it kind of goes at the other end of the spectrum. But where the bigger concern is definitely going to be is the postnatal time. Yes. Um, Absolutely. That is a big concern. And um, I think that it would be very sensible um, for women to make a decision that there is one person that is going to be there, uh, that is going to be in their bubble and it's going to be part of, of their um, assistance afterwards. And ideally, this is a, in the ideal world, this is a woman who has given birth several times and breastfed several babies successfully. Mm. Okay. That in the ideal scenario is who you would want in your bubble. And maybe it, it would be a case of, you know, you choose a girlfriend or, um, or your mother or your mother or somebody, but they need to have successfully breastfed. And so they're confident mm -hmm. to sit there at home with you and mm -hmm. physically help you latch your baby. Yes. Because that will be definitely the hardest part um, is, is, coping with all of that afterwards yeah and um current research um suggests that COVID-19 does not pass through the am amniotic fluid but once a baby is born they are at risk of catching um the disease so hospitals have introduced some uh, new procedures to make sure the newborn and the mother are safe um can you just share to some of them that you're aware of at the moment I mean, basically, it just comes down to all the same procedures that they sort of, you know, are doing with, with everybody else in the hospital with the, with the PPE gear, et cetera. Um, and certainly, you know, trying to have women in single rooms where they can, um, keeping the baby with the, with the mother as much as possible, you know, just really pretty sensible stuff. If you have an option to have a postnatal stay in a birth centre rather than a hospital, then I think that would be strongly preferable at the moment. Mm. And having a baby um, in a hospital, as you mentioned before, is quite commonly perceived as being the safest place to do so. Um, however, more women than ever um, before are considering home birthing to avoid the hospital. So the question is, who is home birth suitable for? Um, great question. And it really does come down to that woman being regarded as having a healthy, normal pregnancy um, and the baby being healthy and normal. So that means that, you know, at the scan at 20 weeks, anatomically, the baby was normal. Um, the growth is normal. The woman is going into labor um, after term. So after 37 weeks, she's got no gestational diabetes. She's got no preeclampsic toxemia. She doesn't have pre-existing medical conditions of concern. Um, 
yeah, so those are sort of the main, we don't have an exceptionally large for dates baby, we don't have an exceptionally small for dates baby, and we are talking of over the 90th centile or below the 10th centile. So just because you have a scan and, a, and somebody says, oh, your baby's a good size, trying to be reassuring, and actually your baby's on the 70th centile, don't suddenly think, oh, your baby's a good size, means you've got this ginormous macrosomic large for dates baby. No. <laughs> We're talking about babies who are diagnosed as large for dates or diagnosed as small for dates. Um, so, yeah, just everything's normal. As long as everything's normal and you are, say, within a 40-minute drive of a secondary care facility, um, or I have certainly done births that have been further away than that, um, but... Yeah, I mean that's the main thing, and it's, it's to be not. Don't be stupid, you know. If you if you know you've got a baby who's a, in a breech position, um, yeah, or you know your baby's very small, or you know you're only thirty six weeks, not thirty, you're fully two. You know, don't do the silly things. If you've got, yeah, you just want to know you're a healthy, normal situation. Mm. And I've read that a lot of elective induction or elective cesarean sections. Um, are procedures that have been cancelled as a result of COVID-19. What's your experience with this? <laughs> I kind of have to say hallelujah, to be honest. They say that around the world that that's, um, elective caesareans are the commonest unnecessary um, surgery that is done on, on the planet. Um, and it is not minor surgery. It is major abdominal surgery every time and it carries a 10% risk of complications um, for the mother or the baby. And yeah. I think that it is treated too lightly, generally, as, you know, oh, I'll just have vaginal bypass surgery and, uh, you know, have a rooftop delivery. So there's a lot of kind of relaxed conversation around it, and there just so shouldn't be. Um, I, a little while ago, my husband had some back surgery, and when we were in the sort of pre-op discussions, um, the uh, specialist made a comment that there's a 1% chance of a complication, and so he was kind of going over there. And I just looked at him and I said, 1%? I said, oh, it's fine. <laughs> like, I said, I'm used to dealing with women who are having C-sections have a 10%. Um, you know, that's high. And uh, and babies that have not had any part, any labour as part of getting ready to be born have a much higher chance of respiratory distress afterwards. Mm. There are very important chemical reactions that hormonally that occur within their body during the labour that gets them ready for breathing you know, extra uterinely. Um, so there are certainly elective seizures that should be done because maybe that woman has placenta previa. But um, in general terms, if it's elective surgery just for vaginal bypass because the woman doesn't want to, it's, uh, what are we doing? Like, mm. like, I can tell you that in the country where I trained in New Zealand, that's not even possible. Yes, yeah. Um, and then the, I guess the idea of taking the newborn home can be overwhelming overwhelming for some parents no doubt there are many parents worried about the guidelines for um separation um at the moment um and others are just naturally scared um of, of contracting uh, the virus so what should be normal postnatal care like uh, what what should be what should it be like during the uh, the pandemic yeah that's that's a good question um it, it would be actually i have for postnatal i can tell you some other sort of notes on that because um, again there's some new guidelines that are coming out so generally speaking on the first three days so sort of day one day two day three there should be some level of face-to-face -face, particularly um, for assisting the woman with um, getting the breastfeeding going well and um, also having her blood pressure checked because after we have a baby, there's always a, a period of risk that our blood pressure can go up. We can get, actually get preeclampsia after having a baby. So um, that, that's important. And then um, let's say probably by day four, um, a phone call would be fine. Um, 
and maybe another face-to-face -face visit somewhere ra ba around day five, six or seven, it would be good for that baby to have a one-week check or around about that. We particularly want to know what their weight loss is um, and making sure that that baby is putting on, you know, is gained back any weight. Yes, yeah. Really, um, in the first few days. Then I'd say probably... Uh, and, and ideally, the woman would have some kind of in-home visit within 24 hours, ideally. But it depends where people live and these different sort of levels of maternity post-care that's provided or not provided. Um, you know, a phone call sort of day eight to nine, maybe another face-to-face -face visit when the baby's a couple of weeks old. Just, you know, weigh the baby. Another option is to weigh is if the woman has digital scales at home and um, she can actually weigh the baby herself. So basically she stands on the scales and weighs herself. Somebody hands her the baby and she weighs herself with the baby. And now we know how, you know, what that baby weighs. Um, but you do need accurate digital scales to do that. And um, on the third week, maybe another sort of phone call follow up and then one more face to face at sort of a month old or so to just to make sure that baby's put on a good kilo in that first month or thereabouts. Wonderful. So overall, do you really think that parents should be concerned or nervous during this time during the pandemic? I think that they should be nervous about the amount that they're interacting unnecessarily with the mm. world while they're still pregnant. And I think that they should be concerned about how much their baby is unnecessarily interacting with the world. Um, and so if they pre keep themselves in a tight bubble um, while they're pregnant and keep their baby in a tight bubble after it's born. I mean, even before all this COVID stuff, you know, I would always tell women, you know, 40 days, 40 nights, don't take your baby anywhere until they are at least over five kilos and at least over five weeks they should stay home mm. and now i'd extend it to 100 days and um yeah. and um birth in a birth center um if, if you have a healthy normal situation or home birth like look at that as a serious option but do be aware that you have to get really good antenatal um, education to do that don't just think that you can roll up to the hospital, like you can roll up to a birth centre without preparing yourself for that. Yes. Um, and 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 seek out one person to to that knows about breastfeeding to to be that, that one person. person to come and visit you afterwards and make sure that they, you know, um, are, are as safe as they can be against COVID as well. You know. Yeah. And what other options personally do you have um, that you could ha offer to mums to be at the moment? Yeah, so um, I, I we're going a bit over time, but that's all right. Big good topics. Um, uh, two things, and that is firstly, I've started up some um, weekly live chats where women can ask questions about home birth or not home birth or birth into birth, whatever. So each week you sort of tend to accumulate some questions, and and it's really great to be asking those if you're um, midwife or obstetrician or maybe not the obstetrician because that's not their territory. Um, primary care birthing, um, but asking of a midwife. But it's it's nice to sometimes get another opinion from somebody else, especially when it, usually midwives we all say the same thing. So when you've heard it from this midwife and you hear it from that midwife, it just kind of feels like oh that probably was good advice that they're both saying the same thing. Yes. Um, and um, so there's that. And then the other thing that I've done is I have a ninety minute um, uh, video all around that teaches natural labor and normal birth. And um, usually people purchase it for $1.99. But during the course of the pandemic, I've decided that Motherwise, my company, we are, we're just making it free. Okay, it's free to anybody in the world. Um, they just go to the website, put in their details, and they instantly get the link for it. And um, it's just one way we can, you know, give back, I guess. Yeah, so we'll have both of those links in the introduction paragraph yeah. for sure where they can have easy access. Yes. Kathy, you've just been an absolute wealth of knowledge today and I'm so grateful for your time and all of the information and support that you've imparted uh, for mums and mums-to-be out there and dads-to-be as well. Um, if um, families and mums um, want to be able to reach you and or have any additional questions, whereabouts, whereabouts can they find you? 
Uh, just go to me at my website, which is kathyfray.com. So K-A-T-H-Y-F-R-A-Y.com. Um, and you can see contact information there. And um, But thank you, Rachel, as well, because, you know, what, what you guys are doing at Kittypedia is just so important. And, um, you know, we just don't want women uh, at this stage referring to Dr. Google for their advice. And, um, you know, and that's really what you're all about there is just making sure that the advice that the is, is sound um, and credible. And so, you know, it's yay. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you again. And we can't wait to have another chat with you again soon, Kathy. Take care. Thanks again. Bye. Stay safe. You too. Bye.